Baby birds, baby birds, baby birds. Welcome back to the nest for another edition of Words of Wisdom. Featuring Bron the Ray Kid. As always, with your friend, Wisdom W. Wisdom. Reach out to Words of Wisdom through the Twitterverse at Words from Wisdom. That's at Words from Wisdom. And now, Everyone's favorite host, Baby Birds, welcome, Wisdom W. Wisdom. Baby Birds, Baby Birds, Baby Birds, welcome back to the nest here on Words of Wisdom, featuring Bron the Raid King. The man, the myth, the legend will be joining us on the TBA phone line shortly. In just a quick minute, we're getting them connected squared away. We've had a couple technical difficulties today, but we're hoping to have that all wrapped up and taken care of for the remainder of the show. All right. And don't forget, y'all can find us on YouTube, Team CND. Search Team CND. Like and subscribe. Give us those thumbs up, baby birds. We love them. We like them. We feed on them. That's what sustains us. Sustains us through the week. Those thumbs up. Mm-mm-mm. Finger licking good. Find us in the Twitterverse at Words From Wisdom. Please stay in our DMs, stay in our mentions. This is how you communicate with the show. This isn't just my show. This isn't just Braun's show. This is our show. Baby birds, you need to keep us in check. You need to tell us what you dig, what you don't. If you got segments that you like ideas for, don't forget, we're still looking for more movie ideas. Bring in those movies for the improv movie segment. We're going to kill it, going to bring it. We're going to tear it all up. Keep sending those in. And you can send those in via Twitter. Or words of wisdom at teamcnd.com. That's words of wisdom at teamcnd.com. Yes, we got an action packed show today. We're going to do a lot. We're going to talk about riot games a little bit for a quick minute, five, ten minutes here or there, about riot games and what it's doing and where it started and where it's going. We're going to talk about e games a bit too. We're going to talk about e games, the leagues a little bit. Not too deep, not too hard. We're going to just kind of scratch the surface of where they started and my personal experiences and Bron's personal experience were there. A lot of you baby birds probably didn't know that old Wisdom, W Wisdom, back in the Disney around the 2002 to 2007 range, used to sponsor some e-game teams back in the day. I did not manage them. I had a manager. And I just put forth the money, but I got to kind of dive into the early stages, the infancy of e-games and how it changed. So we're going to talk about that in the later half of the show. So that should be a good time for all y'all. We're going to kill that a little bit. But the next thing we're going to talk about, kind of when we get Braun here connected, and it looks like he is connected. All right. We're going to dive into a little bit of some fun facts, some weird facts that I found. Some weird facts that a friend of mine had sent me. And we're going to dive into some of those and see how many of you baby birds and how many Braun, the man, the myth, the legend, knew and understands and grows and gravitates. We will be back after these messages with the man, myth, the legend, Braun, the Raid King, right after this. Baby birds, baby birds, baby birds. Welcome back to another edition of Words of Wisdom. Featuring the man, myth, legend, Bron the Raid King. He is standing by on the performance. Oh my goodness. Not the performance. One of these days I'll get this thing right. On the TBA phone lines. The TBA phone line. And remember, you can hit us up on the YouTube action. Just search Team c and Please like and subscribe. Hit us up on the Twitterverse at Words From Wisdom. Stay in our mentions. Get in the DMs. And throw in your gaming grab bag questions or your life questions or just any random thoughts you got towards myself and Braun. You could let us know how we're doing, how much you hate us, how much you hate the sound of my voice, that you can't stand the rhythms and the bass and the beat just flowing with it. And you can't stand how squeaky Braun is. You just can't stand it. All right. Let us know. And that's words of wisdom at teamcnd.com. That's words of wisdom at teamcnd.com. And with that, we will bring in the man, myth, the legend, Braun the Ray King. What's going on, baby bird? How you doing, brother? I'm doing all right. I'm trying to get excited for baseball, but as a Mariners fan, it's like rooting to, it's like wanting to play Battletoads on Nintendo. It's just, just beating yourself up for no reason. Well, I can talk about Battletoads. I love that game, man. That was a great, great game. You did not love Battletoads. You did not. It was, see, that's the last time games were difficult. 
the Nintendo games. Hold on a second. Let's let's investigate this before we get into the baseball thing. I'll address that as well. But let's investigate Battle Toads and the original Ninja Turtles and stuff like that. Not the arcade sky side scrolling game, but the original one that they had in there. Very difficult. Were they just difficult because we were twelve years old, ten years old, eight years old, or were they physically harder to play those games? Uh, the Ninja Turtle one was legitly difficult. Remember, the, I think it's the water level that got everybody hung up on it. We had to disarm the bombs, and you had to go through like the little spikes and everything. But Battle Toads, honestly, level three was in, in, um, impossible to beat. You could not beat it without a game genie. Uh, I swear, the game creators of that game realized that they weren't going to be able to finish it and just made level three unbeatable. I think level three was one of the biggest trolls in gaming history. And, was, and that's on Battle Toads. I'm trying to remember. Was level three the speed one where you go super fast through those? through the cavern and you're going, you just start zooming so fast. You all those obstacles you got to avoid. Is that level three? Yeah. They just made it impossible. My nah, man, that wasn't impossible. It was tough. It was tough, but it wasn't impossible. That shit was impossible. Whatever. I'm pretty sure that was level three. Level three is impossible. Yeah. I, I don't, I've never, I never met what, I mean, maybe you've been, maybe you'll be the first guy I've met that's beaten level three. If it's the one I'm thinking of, but battle toads was an unbeatable game because there was one level along the way where it was three or four. Or you could not beat it. You legitimately could not beat that game. Uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying, baby. But I personally didn't beat that one. But my brother, man, he did it. I remember him. He beat the game. He beat the your game. Brother, your brother might have been the Ken Griffey Jr. of Battletoads then because that guy just had unworthy talent. It was tough. Don't get me wrong. It was extraordinarily tough to do this. It was extraordinarily tough to do it. And I tried it a bunch, and I was bad. And I almost got through it a few times. But I think he memorized. Damn, we should call him up, get him on, get him on the show live, and be like, "Hey, man, how did you beat that level three in Battle Toads?" I think it was if you memorize the course, you could memorize the course. I don't think it was randomized. So you memorize the course, and you memorize when it's going that top speed like crazy fast. You memorize the time it takes to get to this point. Okay, I got to go down, up, down, and you got to do it before it's on the screen. Otherwise, you'll crash into it. I think it got to the point, though, on one part of that level where you, you got, like, a Sophie's Choice of options where it didn't matter what you did, you're going to get boned anyway. I think there was just one spot there where it didn't matter how fast your reaction or your memory was. I want to say that it just it, it set you up to fail. Now, I could be wrong, you know. It's been, whoa, who knows how many, over 20 years, 25 years since I've played Battletoads on Nintendo. So maybe that'd be a fun thing to do, just fire up the old emulator and try to play Battletoads again. <laughs> I think it would be, man. The Battletoads, the action would be fantastic. I haven't played that in such a long time. I think it would be really cool, really cool to play. And for all those baby birds out there, Battletoads is a Nintendo game, as in Zelda, the original, as in Super Mario Brothers, the original, as in Duck Hunt, which I don't know if they ever made a remake of that game, but that was one of the original D games. Double Dragon. Yes, Double Dragon. And those were original Nintendo. So all you little baby birds out there, you 13, 14 year olds, you 21 year olds, get yourself an emulator. You can get it right on Google, emulate that stuff, and you can get those games. It should be all free. Steam might even have that kind of stuff now. Yeah, we should do a challenge, actually. We should do like a contra challenge or something. Just pick some obscure games and just record our best, our one playthrough from the very beginning and just see which of us can get farther on those old games. That might be a bad idea. Maybe we'll do a little something with that. Maybe we'll have to come up with a little contest for that for the listeners. That'd be fun, man. That'd be real fun. We'll figure that out. But let's go. Let's move to those Mariners. Let's go to the baseball. Because baseball, I'm not a huge fan of baseball. I dig statistics. I d dig numbers. So that's really the only reason I liked baseball back in the Dizzy. But well, we're getting pretty close to the season, right? In April? It kicks off in April or something? Yeah. Well, the Mariners are basically the Cleveland Indians for Major League. They, you think they're going to be good. And then they just troll you and they just suck again. Um, Mariners right now, I think, are the the professional franchise with the longest non-playoff drought. They haven't been in the playoffs in 17 years. And to give you some aspect, I think Felix Hernandez has been here there the entire time. Won a Cy Young, been one of the most dominant pitchers in baseball, and has yet to play in a, a, a postseason. Felix Hernandez. Don't you all got Ichiro? Oh, man, we haven't had Ichiro for years. I think he's played for – since he left Seattle, he played for the Yankees, the Marlins. I don't know. I mean, I don't know where he's at now, but uh, I think he's just on a quest to get 3,000 here in the state before he retires. Oh, I'm, I'm a lot of touch with the baseball. And I think our listeners don't really give a crap about baseball, too. So 
let's figure something else out. So let's we got this going. Let's we got this going. So I found a couple of wacky informations. I want to see how many of these things you knew, Brown. And the listeners, how many things you guys know. And I think we got some production for this, right? We got production? Go ahead and send that over to my touchpad. Yeah, go ahead and send that production over to my touchpad, please. Thank you. All right, to touchpad. And here we go. This is for the, we're going to do 15 of the wildest things. I guess the production, we'll talk about it. We'll just listen to production. We're good. AIDS is a deadly, incurable disease, but no matter how you come to judge, Charles Wheeler and his partners in ethical, moral, and in human terms, the fact of the matter is, when they fired Andrew Beckett because he had AIDS, they broke the law. Uh, I think that is mislabeled. You sent me the wrong one. That seems to be... Was that... Was that Denzel from Philadelphia? It sounded like Denzel Washington in Philadelphia. That's kind of a buzzkill, uh, a little bit, you know. Um, I'm this. I'm not gonna touch these drops. No, I'm not gonna try it again. You all get it right. I'm not trying that again. I'm just gonna go ahead and say what this is. So these are crazy, wild, weird facts. I, I don't even know if I can do this, man. I mean, hearing that—that's one of the most serious lines in any movie, probably in the history of movies, right? I mean, it's up there. It's up there with Polly Shore in the army now where he goes, this isn't war. War is when you put your hand in a pile of goo that two minutes earlier was your friend's face. Now that is war. This is just a game. <laughs> All right. Well, we just compared Polly Shore to Denzel Washington. <laughs> that'll be the Come first... on, Polly Shore is great. Yes, that will be the first and only time you will hear Denzel Washington and Polly Shore brought up in the same sentence in the history of movies. Fantastic. All right, so we got weird facts. So these are just strange facts for y'all. So this is what I'm going to go with, Bron. So num- one of these facts. I'm not even going to number. I'm just going to go for you. And we'll discuss some of them that are a little different. All right. The longest time between two twins being born. Take a guess how long. The longest time between mm, two twins let's being see. born. Two twins being born, longest time in between. Well... I'm going to assume that there's more than a day separation because I know how labor works. I'm going to say, I'm going to say two and a half days. You're close, buddy. You're close. And that, you got your medical, t- um, you know, finesse. That yeah, you I was pulling in some knowledge there. Yeah, so you got the medical stuff. You worked in the hospitals. You've seen a lot of things. You maybe even delivered babies, you know, stuff like that. So the longest time between two twins being born is 87 days. 87 days. I wasn't even close. What are you talking about? You were not I said close. two and a half, 87. You are correct. So these kids are almost. Oh, okay. So what happened was one of them had a medical emergency, I'm assuming, and was C sectioned out. And the other one was okay. So they left it in there. And the other one came out three months later. And the other one was basically a preemie baby that had some type of medical condition. I'm guessing that's how it goes. I was thinking more natural birth. So you got me on that one. Oh, for one. All right. Fantastic. The world's deepest post box is in Susami Bay in Japan. It is 10 meters underwater. <laughs> no. Huh. I think it's just a statement. <laughs> it is, yeah, I guess it is a statement. That's, that's wild, man. How can you deliver the mail? Like someone gets in scuba gear, jumps down there and delivers the mail down there? I don't understand that. Yeah, I think I saw something on this once. If I'm just pulling my knowledge, it's a place where people go scuba diving or reef diving or something to that effect. And it's just like some type of artifact that's down there. Um, I can't remember the reason for it, but I know somebody does dive down there and put something in the box. I just can't recall what it is. Uh, I want you to take a guess on this one. This is a good one. The oldest condoms ever found to date. How long ago do you think this was? The oldest condoms across the world. Well, let's see. How long has Catholicism been around? Um, Oldest condoms. Let's see. They used to be lambskin of some type or uh, intestines. That's what they used to use. Um, So I'm going to go ahead and say. Let's go. Let's go. 1400s. Oh, you were close, my man. You're on the right trap. The oldest condoms ever found to date, they date back to 1640s. They were found in a cesspit at Dudley Castle and were made from animal and fish intestines. So you were right on the right track. 
Like, yeah, yeah, but it was unopened in some guy's wallet, the poor bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know, Bron, that everyone has a unique tongue print, just like their fingerprints? No, I did not know that either. So if you were to get your fingers cut off and you committed a crime, they could identify you by your tongue print. So then the option, obviously, is just to cut the tip of your tongue off. So then you're, you're golden. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Did you know that most puppets are left-handed? And do you know why they are left-handed? The thumb. It's got to be because of the thumb. Put your hand in a puppet. The thumb's easier to use than your other fingers. And, and your, uh, yeah, I'm just going to say thumb because of where it's located. Because most puppeteers are right-handed. So they operate the head with their favorite hand. No, but the puppet's left-handed, right? Like The, the puppet's puppet left-handed, itself. correct. The puppet's left-handed. It's got to be because of the thumb, right? It's got to be a thumb. Well, I'm guessing right because, you know, the puppeteer would be the right-handed because they're right-handed, so they would have... Yeah, I mean, just put your hand up like you're up a puppet. Move your thumb and then move your pinky. The thumb is just way more easy and and smooth for me. I assume that's why it's the thumb. Well, now we're going to test your animalistic knowledge. All right. What All right. mammal? I'll even break it down for you. What land-based mammal have three vaginas? Jeez. Um. There's one. Uh, there's only there's there. This is real. This is real, and it goes on two legs. Okay, you know that. Oh, okay. I'm going to say kangaroo then. Oh, look at you. Look at you. You got, wow, I'm impressed. I'm, you ain't using the Google machine over there, are you? That's impressive. No, I was, I was going to go with rodent. I was going to go with a, a rat of some type or some type of mouse until you said two legs. And then I just assumed what's the biggest r- rodent on two legs and it's got to be a kangaroo. <laughs> Did you know it costs the U.S. Mint almost twice as much to mint each penny and nickel as the coins are actually worth. Yeah, I think it's been that way since the 90s, if I recall. I saw this once, too, where the, at one point it was like 1.1 cent to create a cent. And so then you're just, once you hit that point, you're just losing money. Yeah, taxpayers lost over $100 million in 2013 just through the coins being made. Well, that seems like a great use of our taxpayer money. Wonderful. Well. You got to keep the Federal Reserve, you got to keep the mint going. Like, if we shut the mint down for 10 years at a time when we need it again, there would be nobody to do, be able to do anything. And plus, by the time you run out of coinage, for people throwing them in the water or lose them in their couches or whatever, you, you'd start having a coin shortage, which would make short churn, uh, like local commerce, uh, harder. But I mean, we're getting to the digital age now where coins are going to be obsolete pretty soon anyway. How's your physics, brother? Are you up on physics? You take some physics classes in, in college? Yeah. And- yeah, I took college level physics. Oh, all right. You actually may know the answer to this question. So what is the slowest speed that light travels that we've recorded it? Oh, I don't know that. Light doesn't necessarily travel at the speed of light. The slowest we've ever recorded light moving is at 38 miles per hour. Oh, so man, when we say we're going to the Mars at the speed of light, we might just be boned. 38 miles an hour, you'd be faster just to go in a car. Yeah, yeah, for real. (laughs) Definitely. All right, let's find a good one here. Oh, here's a good one. There we go. The northern leopard frog swallows its prey using what part of its body? Oh, I hope it's not its butt. Um, Its butt? The northern leopard frog swallows its prey using its eyes. It uses really? them to help push food down its throat while retracting them into its head. Wow, I'd have to look at that. So the eyes must go in like a turtle into some enclosure. Ah, oh, that's wow, that's wild. Man, evolution's pretty scary when you think of it. I don't know why that creature had developed that evolutionary trait and hopefully that doesn't win out because i'd hate to see humans in the future having to do that (laughs) let's get this one all right who was the first man or woman to urinate on the moon well i mean we've got two choices right we got buzz aldrin and uh 
Oh wow! Don't do this to me. Um, let's just go with Buzz Aldrin. You're a winner, buddy. Yeah, well, come on. Was he Buzz Aldrin and um, come on, Sam Shepard? Wasn't he in the thing? Uh, who was he? Neil Armstrong? There you right? go. Buzz, That's yeah, what I assumed I mean, you were gonna say. That would have been wrong. So your inability to recall properly saved you right there. Well, I think I'd still go with Buzz anyway. Man, that guy just pissed vinegar. Remember, he's the guy that when somebody said you never went to the moon, he punched the guy out. So I think I'd still Buzz feels like he seems like the guy that would piss on the moon. So I would have went with him anyway if I could have remembered him. Some fruit flies are genetically resistant to getting drunk but only if they have an inactive version of a gene scientists have named question mark. Uh, ethanol gene, something with ethanol, maybe? Scientists have named the gene happy hour. Oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> so, I mean, so now they're just going to leave crap in your drink and not get drunk. That's not fair. <laughs> In 1567, the man said to have the longest beard in the world died after he tripped over his beard running away from a fire. Yeah, he just might have been a catch-22. I mean, if the fire is bad enough for you have to run from it, as opposed to just walk, calmly walk away from it, uh, you're probably pretty pretty much screwed anyway. So, um, I don't know how old he is, but he probably would have died soon after that anyway. Well, he tripped on his beard. Man, like, I, I don't know how you get it that long without having some ability to, like, swing it over your shoulder or something. That would be rough. There's a cat that has the longest hair in the world. He wears a turban-esque head device where he wraps it all in there. I believe it is 35 feet long of dreadlock or something like that that he has. Pretty impressive. It weighs... Like 40 pounds he carries around in his head. Is the did he grow his hair that long because of a religious belief or just because he wanted to be the guy with the, with the longest hair? He just he says he just went ahead and started letting it grow, and there was no particular reason, no particular angst. He just never wanted to get it cut. Yeah, the reason why he said yeah. he didn't want to get it cut was he once went to a barber in his teens and he didn't like how the barber cut his hair and he never went again. I mean, that sounds rational. I think I think it's time for him to get over it and just get his hair cut. Why does he cut it himself at this point? That's a good question. You know, you could just cut it yourself. For real. I, I'm with you on that one. All right. So we'll do one more of these bad boys. We'll do one more of these bad boys. So this is a good one. I don't think anyone is going to... I can't even say this as a question because there's no way you're going to get this. But it's interesting. The Dance Fever of 1518 was a month-long plague of un explicable dancing in Strasbourg in which hundreds of people danced for about a month for no apparent reason. Several of them danced themselves to death. Hmm. That's just strange. So they just unexplicably just started dancing and they just couldn't stop dancing. It was probably some, some globalist weapon being used on them or something like aliens. You know, the problem was, that's not the only thing that's strange that's happened back about that time period was, there's another story of, in Warsaw, the mayor of Warsaw is walking down the street, just walking down the street, ringing his bell, that's what he does every morning at a certain time, it'd be 8 a.m., walking down the street of Warsaw, just like any other day, and some people gather around and just say hello and blah, 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 there's about 20, 25 people around the area seeing it, he walks to the middle of the square, bangs his whistle, his, uh, his bell in the middle of the square, and explodes, spontaneously combusts, just blows up like a bomb in the middle of town and shoots himself all over all the spectators and all stuff, and he's just gone, blows him up. When, when was this? This is, I believe, was in the 1600s or the 1400s in Warsaw, the mayor of Warsaw. All right, Europe. so there's no way it was just an old latent mine that he stepped on. It was... No, uh, he was this is... No, he didn't even spontaneously combust. He spontaneously exploded? Yes, he literally exploded is what the historian books say, whether they're true or not. Who knows? There's no pictures back then, right? Other than ones people what draw. Do you, what do you think the odds are that he just got hit by a meteorite or something? He just happened to be in that one spot. Fate just said, F you, guy. 
Yes, he could have, right? People wouldn't have known what it was, so they just would have said he blew up. Something exactly, like that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That's that's possible. There's another one that's that's very stranger. I cannot remember the name of this one, so it's a little unhinged. But about right about the same time, 1600s, 1500s, it strangely started to rain herring, the fish. And yeah, this is this is a common thing. This happens actually more often than people think, especially with like uh, also happens with frogs, but fish. It's basically what happens is a tropical storm or a um, hurricane or or some type of waterborne tornado will pick up a group of things, funnel them all up into the sky because they're light, and then drop them down sometimes miles and miles away from the original spot. So what you're telling a brother is there's Sharknado one, two, three, and four by the Sci-Fi Channel that. This could really happen. That we're going to need Tara Reed to save us from Sharkado. You got to worry about that stuff. You're on the West Coast. So, so you're telling me Sharkado, Sharknado, Sharkado, Hurricano, whatever the hell call it, can actually happen. We got to worry about sharks from the sky eating us in midstream. I think it's more like trout NATO. I don't think a, shark, a group of sharks would be in one position in large enough quantities and be small enough to be pulled up by something like that. Uh, they're usually, uh, if they are in schools, they're they're not going to be big ones. The big ones are usually isolationists. So I assume that Sharknado and it's the and just the uh, the what was it the the qual- quantity of Nados and Sharknado. No, maybe a trout Nado now and then, but I don't. I think we're safe from the Sharknados. Oh, whoa, um, that's good because sharks. We saw seen Jaws when I was a little kid. Man, sharks have just scared the bejeebas out of me. And I love the water. Like I dig the water. I was like a little fish when I was a kid swimming in the water all the time, but I'd always get hesitant in the ocean just because I seen Jaws, dog. So you just really, really, whew, that's a relief off these shoulders. And my goodness, my shoulders can use it, that relief. And that fantastic segment was brought to you by Puria Aqua Springs. Don't grab a soda. Don't grab a juice. Grab a natural, purified, delicious, refreshing, relaxing Puria Aqua Springs. There really is only one choice. Grab a bottle of Puria Aqua Springs at your local mart today. And we will be back after these messages to dive into the world of Braun the Ray King. He's going to explain to us Riot, League of Legends. We're going to dive deep into it. Not just how it works now, but how it started and how it became so popular to the masses. We'll be back after this. It's time for your information update. In 1923, jockey Frank Hayes won a race at Belmont Park in New York, despite being dead. He suffered a heart attack mid-race, but his body stayed in the saddle until his horse crossed the line for a 20-to-1 outsider victory. Yeah, that shouldn't be able to count. That shouldn't count for one reason. His dead body flopping back and forth is like the biggest hit to a horse you could ever get, right? You want to make when they try to make the horse go faster, they smack it, right? His dead, just lifeless body just smacking that horse just caused that horse to just go into the unearthly next gear. So I don't, yeah, I don't think that I don't think you should be able to die and uh, win the race still. You know, but I think there's a there may be now after that after Jockey Frank Hayes won the race after that. There might be rules now, but there was probably new, no rules in, instituted for that at that point, right? So you just got to roll the punches. If a brother dies and you got to, you know, run that horse, you just run in the end. You know that maybe the horse loved the jockey so much, sensed there was something wrong, and just ran to where it knew it could get help. You ever think of that, bro? Oh, maybe the horse. Oh, just tried to run the finish line to get medical attention. Yeah, you ever think of that? Because horses do. Maybe, feel. hey, maybe. Animals do feel. Let me tell you this. I fell down. You know, I had some medical issues a little bit. So I was walking my dog the other day and it's icy and there's snow all over the place. And he went over a snowbank and he went, you know, went wild a little bit. He was going good. And there's no problem. I went over the snowbank just walking and I fell over. And the first thing that dog did, he stopped chasing whenever he was chasing. He ran back as fast as he could and basically jumped on me and started licking me in the face, making sure I was all right. Because that dogs and animals just know when something happens, they can feel it and they will be there for you. I mean, I don't know. It's just a, how would he know? I don't know. I guess maybe you're right. But it's just a dead body on the back of a horse, man. I don't, I don't know how to, a dog sees you fall. I guess you're right. I'm trying to, I'm trying to rationalize it away somehow, but I, I think I could come back to your, your take on it. I would like to apologize, ladies and gentlemen. We're having a few problems with the TV performance line. 
the TBA phone line right now with a you can hear Bron's connections a little wild, Ricky Ricky wild. So what kind of what kind of high speed internet you got over there, Bron? I know you're living out in the country, brother. What you got rolling, man? Yeah, I got some. I think it's LTE direct line of sight internet, which I'm super fortunate to even have it. Um, we didn't have any type of high high speed internet. We were basically on the slowest possible DSL, which you couldn't play much of anything, let alone watch videos or anything. But I got lucky having this property up on top of a hill with a giant tree, and um, I got me some internet. That seems finally. Pretty, what did they have to do anything special to make this work? Like, how did you? Yeah, they, yeah. I saw a company when I was driving through this little town near where I live, and they had a sign saying "Breeze Wi-Fi High Speed Internet," and because of where we live, every time anybody says anything about internet, I, I call them to see if there's a possibility. I'm waiting for like, I was waiting for like Facebook to get their little micro satellite or Elon Musk's micro satellites or Facebook to get their drones flying around. But um, I contacted these guys and it was like, I didn't hear nothing back for two weeks. So I figured it was probably a non-issue. And then my dog started barking one day and I go outside and there's a guy saying he was there from the internet company. So I get all excited. And we're looking around the property for trees to put it on, and he's not really finding any trees that would work with the line of sight to where I, where I needed to go. And I remembered that we have this giant 100-foot tree basically in the front yard. We're in the very corner of our property. And so I asked him about that one, and he couldn't believe he missed it. But he brings his little drone out there, flies the drone up the tree. Wait, looks guys, tree. a drone? Yeah, uh, like, a, like one of those personal drones, but it was like a really fancy one. I'd never seen anything like it. Um, he flew it up there. It showed like the altitude and everything of where he was at. And then he flew it over to neighbors. You could see the, the city through two valleys. Luckily, this tree was in a position up on a hill where we could see down to the city that was eight miles away. And uh, the next thing I know, they're, they're climbing the tree. They're putting up like a, a, a radar ditch out there or a dish of some type. People probably know more about this than me. And uh, now I have basically a living antenna out there where now all my neighbors are trying to get them to come put their internet up on my tree. And I'll probably end up being able to get my internet for free and some money on the back end because I basically have like a, um, a Wi-Fi tower now on my property. So uh, I'm getting that now. And that's what allowed me to get back into this. And right about the time we got that, um, everybody started hitting me up. You guys started hitting me up with Pantheon stuff. So I'm, all, I'm all back in the fold because of this internet. Well, thank you so much, drone. I didn't know drones were this. Drones are taking on the world. Technology. That's for another show. But this is this is getting wild. The stuff that's happening, it's just wild. But let's 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 table the technology sphere and let's hit up because we only got about twenty minutes left. Let's hit up Riot Games. Let's hit up League of Legends. Let's start at the beginning, though. Let's start at the beginning. Let's not just dive into where it's now. A lot of us, a lot of the folks that are listening to the podcast, all the baby birds out there. They understand that e-games are huge right now, and they're getting bigger and bigger. Schools are giving scholarships away for e-gamers and all that kind of jazz, too. So it's pretty cool stuff. Finally, gaming is paying off in a big, big way. But let's say where it started. I remember playing. I haven't played League of Legends in forever, but I remember playing that. Was it six years ago when the beta was out and was playing that? I, that's when I started, man. So why don't you just start us out, Braun, on your travels through League of Legends. With what? What? Where did it start? At? How did it start? Well, let me back up. I played uh, the original Dota back when it was on Warcraft 3 mod. And I played that for years. And then when it went to um, the newer version, then it went to Frozen Throne. And Frozen Throne had a newer version. So I was there from basically in Dota from the beginning. And then I played Heroes of New Earth. Well, then I lost the internet and couldn't really play any games out here. But we did have 1.2 speed DSL, which I ended up finding out I could play League of Legends. It was like one of the only games I could play out here without basically lag spiking the entire time. So I started picking that up. I've only been playing that for, I think, a year and a half or so. And um, so that's about as much. I don't really know the backstory other than it was a MOBA that was designed after Dota. And uh, But I'm enjoying it. I find it to be a lot more fast-paced than Dota, whereas Dota has a lot of other skills that you need to have. I, I just like the speed and the reactions you need in, inside of League of Legends. It's almost like a MOBA fighting game to me. I got you. I got you. I played in the very, very beginning when it was just, uh, like I haven't played in the last three years, really. I played when it was just Twinkle and Riot's Eye, when there was, wasn't that many people playing at the time. It was in the beta. They were still redoing a lot of their classes. And I only played two two characters. I played Blitzcrank, and I played Rise. And Rise is completely different now. I believe they've changed him four or five times since I played 
back in the Dizay, rise when the game first started. If you played him correctly, you were just an assassin rise. You would stock up on tons of AP. You would stock up on, there was a, I'm trying to remember what the book was called. I don't think it's in there any longer. But the way it worked was you got AP stacked when you got assists and you got AP stacks when you got kills, like three times as much when you actually got kills. And there was a book. Yeah, majors. Yeah, yeah. They still, they still got that item. They still yeah. got that. All right. So you would get crazy amounts of AP stacking on Rise, and Blitz would also get lots of. I played an attack Blitz. So I would do AP Blitz before AP Blitz was around. No one knew about it. So I would get that would be my first item I get on Blitz. And his alt would just crazy amounts of damage pop up, alt, people would just die. I dropped 22 and fours, 20, 28s and fives on Blitz constantly all the time and rise was off the chains you'd see and this led to the change in rise pretty quick you'd see five or ten other guys that could do this well cats i'll say because i don't know if they're dudes or girls whatever don't matter that could drop like rise people complained so much about just the five or ten people that knew how to play rise like this you'd sneak around wait for people to get stacked up because his alt would be the ball bouncer that was his alt and his alt would do insane amounts of damage if you got the ball to bounce about four or five times in between people if you had 500 ap you could drop guys from full life that were on a turret trying to break it down to three of them stand next to each other you'd kill all three of them with the alt if you popped it at the right time and you did it now you died real easy you couldn't make rise super tanky originally so he was more of an assassin type play so that was a big thing. When they changed Rise, I was upset because I loved it. I, my average score with Rise back in the Diz A was, this is before the game was released, this was in the beta, was was 27 and 5. That was my average scores with Rise. Sometimes I'd only drop like 22 and have lots of assists. Sometimes I'd go drop 45 and just in Summer's Rift, 45 kills and 5 deaths, that type of thing. My best game ever with Rise, which I had screenshots still, but that's so long ago, it was 39 and 0. With Rise was the best one I ever had. 39, 0, and 2. Well, what? This a go. Help me out, Brian. I haven't played in a long time. Is it 39, then assists, and then deaths? No, it's kills, a deaths, assists. Okay, so it'll be 39, 0, and 12 was my best game ever as Rise. Well, if you go kill the death ratio. Yeah, well, it's just a fun thing to play. And now they changed it up quite a bit, and you got a little more of the new game. But check this out. Like, gain in popularity. What do you think made the game gained so much popularity because when I played it really wasn't that popular. I think it's something they just stayed consistent with it. Uh, Riot seems to be a game that when they notice something's wrong, they, they work to fix a champion or they mean like Rise. They've remade Rise so many times. They they recognize when he's either too strong or too weak or the play style doesn't fit right. And so they're willing to accept the fact that they're not going to get it right all the time and that they need to redo it. I mean, there's currently multiple champions. I think Swain just got redone. Um, so they're, they're constantly willing to remake champions they have out there. They update the graphics a lot more. I think they just it's just they stay on top of it. Every new patch comes out with nerfs to certain champs to try to bring them back in line with every other champion. So there's not like super strong champions that so other ones aren't getting played. So I think it's just that, that they're way more consistent with, one, their community outreach, and two, their ability to um, update in the right ways. So, uh, yeah, and also you can customize your, your uh, play style a little bit more in League of Legends than you could say like in Dota. That's a big thing too. When I played, it was, I noticed that a whole bunch of logging in now, there's a whole bunch of new stuff, man. They didn't have any of that stuff when I was playing. They have a little different style. They got some different maps that you can play on now too. They got a little different style of like your ruin setup and your ruin pages and all that jazz is much more elaborate than it was when I was playing. So why don't you talk a little bit on that? Like what that means? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the rune system just happened. They got rid of the old skill trees and made it a little bit more what people thought was going to be a little bit more linear, but there's a lot of playstyle difference you can make. You can play the same champion with multiple different uh, rune pages now. So that's kind of nice. They're, they're just willing to always update and try things. Uh, I think you should give it another try. There's so many good champions out there right now. Um, I'm This is my third season. I'm trying to climb the ladder still. So I'm currently in the silver, top of silver. So I'm trying to get into that gold this season, but yeah, it's just I think they're just they're just it's just really well done. There's not a lot of issues I have with the League of Legends. I think the only thing that bugged me at the very beginning when I first started playing it was you couldn't deny creeps, and I'd gotten so used to doing that in Dota that you could deny your opponent a lot of stuff by doing that. So I, I kind of like had the ability to I had to switch to stop focusing on that to 
focusing more on dodging skill shots because in this game it seems like they people can lay them down a lot quicker and faster. I remember one of the coolest things about Riot Games, this is going way back time machine a little bit, was there was a cat, I cannot remember his name, I'm sure he's still working for him now, but he got hired by, I think they've hired a few people that were just part of the community back in the beta that were so involved in the community, did tutorial videos, did all sorts of statistical analytics for them and put them on the forums and all that jazz. I think Fresh was one of them. I think Fresh was one of them. I can't remember exactly his name, but I think Fresh. Don't hold me to that. And there's a couple other cats that they literally, Riot Games, the small company, noticed they were building popularity and building momentum. And they hired these guys like out of the gate. That's so cool that they looked at the community, saw people in the community that they thought would be good fits for their company and literally interviewed them and hired them and brought them on board. That I thought was pretty neat. Yeah, I mean, you can find a lot of people to fill jobs, but if you can find somebody that can do that job and is super passionate about what they're doing, they're always going to be a better choice. Yeah, that's pretty exciting stuff. And let's talk a bit, a little bit about some of the newer stuff that's going on, man. Like the e-games, e-sports, e-fame. Let's talk about how big this is. This is getting pretty big. I believe League of, I believe League of Legends is one of the biggest e-sport games right now, right? Yeah, off the top of my head, it's probably uh, League of Legends, Counter-Strike Go, Dota. Not in any particular order, but I think those might be the top three right now. I know that fighting too, fighting right? games kind of have their own little niche, but I think those are the top three. Yes, and you can do a lot of different stuff. Like we talked about before in the past, that you parents out there, you older baby birds, you can start training your children, your little your little baby birds there, and your little chicks. Get them ready to rock and roll. Sit them in front of the computer. Keep them high, flying, ready to rock and ride, and they can get themselves college paid for. So you don't got to drop $150,000 on college for each one of those little ones. You can have them go to a Division One school. Illinois is a big one. I talk about Illinois a lot because I've done a lot of research on Illinois. There are other ones as well. But there is research, and Illinois will pay for your kid's college if they're good enough to play these e-games. So that's pretty slick. They don't got to be big jocks. They don't got to be super intelligent, smart, road scholars. They can have e-game experience and be incredible e-game players. Have the right types of attitudes, they can literally be coached on the college division one level. You know, something I'm just thinking about right now because you're talking about college, and I'm I, then I start thinking about let me give it a breakdown. Say college, uh, the esports teams, I then think college, regular teams, I then think boys, girls teams. They don't have like a female division of esports yet, but I think that I think we're waiting for esports to have an iconic female that can come up and play like there's a lot of those streamers out there, but I think that they, they can really use that and that's going to help propel the sport because then it will make it a multi-gender sport. Cause right now I'm trying to think of all the e-games I've seen. I don't know if I've ever seen a woman or a female play in any of these competitions. I mean, I'm sure there are, but I just haven't seen one. Yeah. I've been out of the competitions for a quick minute. I was pretty heavily invested back in the day. You're talking counter-strike 1.5, 1.6, Right before they released Source, I used to sponsor teams. So I didn't manage the teams. I just paid for all of their stuff. So their rooms, their board, some computer components, that kind of jazz things that weren't sponsored, I paid for. And they played in tournaments. They played in the CPO. They played in some of the other stuff. CPO is the biggest one. I think that's probably still around. That's the big one that was down in Grapevine, Texas, in the big old hotel. Coliseum looks like a big dome. They got a lot of, it's a nice hotel, a nice place. They got huge, huge conference rooms. And I remember the first CPL that I sent people down to, I didn't go. I just had the manager of the team run it. One of my good buddies who thought we could make some money doing this type of thing. And unfortunately, we didn't really make too much money, but we also didn't lose any money. So I was happy about that, being the cat behind the business there. And they would go down there. And I think the first one only had a couple thousand people that they went to down there. And I know when I went down there, when I went to go talk to Angel and a couple of other cats, I don't, Angel was one of the cats that put it on. He was the big face behind it. I talked to him a little bit when I was down there. I went down there with my girl um, down at 205, 06, 07, somewhere in that range. Can't remember the exact dates. And it had grown dramatically. It grown huge. Instead of being like 1,500 people and having just nerds 
at this thing, right? Because that's what everyone thought e-gaming was back then, was just nerds. You got to be like a 17-year-old pimply-faced little white kid playing. And I'm not a pimply face of the white kid, that's for sure. You know what I'm saying? I think a lot of people probably figured out from the sound of my voice. But that's okay. That's all right. Maybe I am. Doesn't really matter. But this time, there was females at the place. There was finally females. Cats were bringing their girlfriends or bringing their wives or bringing their fiancés. The booths finally figured out, and this was a big discussion that I have had, was you need to make sure that you have all sorts of different venues at these booths. They can't just be these nerdy type of cats at the booths. You need to show the whole spectrum because I'm an in-the-closet gamer. I was. I was an in-the-closet gamer for 10 years. I was a Division One athlete, did all this other jazz, right? Worked for MTV, did all this other shit. I'm not going to go through the whole list, whatever. Doing all this stuff, man. But I was so in the closet. I was hiding between the relationships that I was in. I was hiding, locking myself in the studio, saying I'm doing work, which technically I was, but I was really just raiding in Swotor, or raiding in Rift with y'all, stuff like that, right? I was doing that jazz instead of doing the actual things that I told my significant other I was doing because I was in the closet gaming. So we needed to, they needed to amplify that. They needed to amplify and bring in all the cats that are really doing this stuff. And there's a lot of females that game. And now it's mainstream. You see, you're talking about the Twitch gamers, some really popular Twitch streamers for females, right? They're playing games and they're good at them too, right? They were doing it back then too. It just was kind of like in the closet. No one really wanted to talk about it. No one wanted to bring it all out. So when they started influxing that into the booths having ladies at the booths having people with the cool sunglasses at the booth having people that are just a little more hip looking at the booths and in the crowd that are playing it really brought about a more advertisable a more significant a more intense role on the actual community of all of us seeing yes espn bro i don't know how much you look at this espn on the podcast list has e game podcast. You know that? No, I didn't know that, but that makes sense. Yeah, you're looking at all these cats that are picking up all these venues. E gaming could be huge, and I hope it is. It's growing fast. It's huge in obviously other countries, Korea. They have stadiums for it, right? And it's finally becoming big in the United States. It takes a while for us to pick up on things, but it's getting there. And the way we're going with technology, and the way it's kind of sprouting, the way that schools and scholarships are rolling. This could be huge, Braun. This could be huge. You could literally be sending your kitties to school for e-gaming and they could literally be making money. That could be their profession. Yeah, I think it's just that we live in a stigma society. And so things like video games had a stigma and it takes something like CPL and eventually it takes money to legitimize it. And then once it's legitimized, it's mainstream. And then it doesn't matter who you are. If you can, if you enjoy it or you can perform in it, it's mainstream. It's legitimized, and the same thing happens with Comic Con. I go, to, I went to Comic Con one time in San Diego, and we lived in Vegas, and now I've gone the past three years in Seattle, and I'm going to go to the Seattle one again this year. And you see a lot more women now than you ever would have, and I think it's just because stuff like conventions also de destigmatize things. You go there and you see that oh no, there's lots of other people here. Plus, you know the movies don't hurt. The fact that Everything from your childhood that used to be a comic book is now getting remade into a movie. Doesn't hurt uh, drawing in different fan bases, but yeah, I think it's just a stigma. Um, you're you're going to see e games get bigger and bigger as the stigma of a kid sitting in the, the quote unquote guy sitting in the basement. Once that guy can win a million dollars, the stigma's gone, and now nobody cares if you're the guy in the basement because hey, you might be the next one million dollar heir. You know, you might be the you might be. I like I I don't know if we had this conversation before, but. I've I've been maintaining that we'll see the first million dollar signed esport athlete in our in our lifetime. Yeah, I would like to see professional leagues soon pop up, and liking to see talking about this. Yeah, I'm not doing anything to make it happen, but it would be cool if someone else did. I love to see professional esport teams. Like if there's a, like League of Legends, for example. I know there's a league. I know there's all that kind of jazz too. But I want to see it hit mainstream. I want to see it on the ESPN. There's so many channels. They had the Ocho going for a quick minute. Let's get ESPN, eGames. Let's get these things on the screens. Let's get these things closer to the masses. Let's get it more like Korea does it, where everybody sees these things. I want a channel where you can flip on the TV and you can see these teams, these games in their jerseys, with their team managers, with their team owners, professional, legitimate type business. And that was the hardest thing before back in the day. It was so hard to keep these teams together and to keep these players going because there wasn't really legitimacy to it, to be honest with you. And I was there. I know what I'm talking about when I'm saying that. I'm talking to the early stages. It was very, very difficult for this to work. 
I couldn't even tell you how much <laughs> troubles my manager had doing, keeping those kids together, keeping these guys together. It was it was tough. It was really tough. Well, there's not really a channel dedicated to esports yet, but I, I don't remember if it's TNT or T- TBS, but one of those channels actually has on Fridays an E-League segment that's usually an hour, two hours long. And last year I watched uh, a Street Fighter tournament, the new Street Fighter tournament. I watched uh, a Capcom Street Fighter tournament. I watched uh, the DC, was it Immortals, the Batman, Superman fighter game. I watched a Counter-Strike Go, the World Tournament. I, there was some Rocket League I kind of skipped over. But it's just st- starting up again. I think on my uh, rec- my uh, DVR, I got uh, a CSGO, docu- like a documentary or whatever, where it goes they're following teams preparing for the new season or whatever. So I, it's getting there. It's, it just takes time. Once once this breaks through, if this does fine, then you know everybody's going to want to have a piece of the action. So I think we're we're probably five years or less away from this becoming a big thing, especially, you know, once Netflix or or Amazon or somebody picks up uh, some type of contract with one of these sports, then it's just going to go off. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, if you had Netflix, I would think Amazon's going to be the next one on that on that ticket train, right? Because they're making the games. They have an engine that is being used in other games. That's going to be pretty slick. That's going to, ooh, Amazon, yes. And they could be right on Amazon Prime. Ooh, yep. ooh. Yep. You call your man Barados. Call him up, dude. Call him up. Tell him to get on that. Get on it. Yeah, it's just a matter of time. You know, they'll have the, the League of Legends or the Counter-Strike Go uh, League sponsored by Amazon. And then Amazon does the prizes and the sponsorships and, you know, how much product uh, product connectivity Amazon has. They have all those different brands that sell through them that they could pull on to make this into a legitimate thing. And like you said, they have that new game coming out. And what, what better than to have uh, your own basically Twitch thing and then also your own being the ones that start out the, the first E-Leagues. I mean, you're basically asking just to be able to be a three-headed monster as far as marketing goes. Yeah, if I had to guess on their plan, I think you're exactly right. I think they're going to do it. I think it's part of their probably a five-year plan to do this because first step one was to buy Twitch for a billion dollars, right? They bought Twitch. Now they're integrating Twitch into their game that they're going to do. They're releasing their game, their MMO that's probably going to revolutionize the industry, I would think. They have unlimited resources, so I would hope it's good. Doesn't mean it will be, but it most likely will be as a good chance of success, right? Yeah. How about this? I just saw a thing this morning uh, that Twitch, the site, has surpassed CNN and MSNBC in viewership. <laughs> I guess so I you can already see Amazon's just getting paid. Yeah, that's in, that's impressive. That's fantastic. And with that, they're going to release. Now, I would think they're going to set up leagues after that in the prominent games. That's where they've always had a problem before making it such mainstream. Was the games kind of go in cycles too? Counter Strike Go has been around for a while now, which is good. It's easy to play. That Riot's games, League of Legends, been around for a while, but games do change. Football doesn't change too much. Football's been about the same for the last fifty years now. Obviously, there's rule changes, that type of stuff. I, I get it. I played a little bit. Not not professional, but I played in college. So I understand that. But those are more finite. The NBA is more finite. Sure, they have the three-point line. Hockey is more finite. Yes, so you can make a league around that. A big, huge league. I think that's been the problem a little bit with doing it in e- esports thus far. Kind of, They're kind of just getting their feet in the in the in the pond is what I'm trying to say. They're kind of just in the, the shallow end right now and been hesitant to, to jump in. And I think they're getting closer to it. Well, how about this right now? It says that Twitch is just under a million viewership a day. Right. And they say that it was purchased for the 1 billion in 2014. And that right now it's, it could be worth as much as $4 billion making that already a $3 billion increase in, in four years. So if they see that as a growth, if they, if that really is, if Amazon seen that type of, uh, dividends paid off on their purchase of Twitch, then I can't imagine that they're going to even slow down one second. I think they're full speed ahead, and they're going to try to be the first one to really do this. Yeah, that's going to be pretty exciting. That's going to be really exciting to see. I'm looking very much forward to that. And this has been brought to you by Curia Aqua Springs. Don't grab a soda. Don't grab a juice. Grab a natural, purifying, delicious, refreshing, relaxing Curia Aqua Springs. They really only have one choice. Grab a bottle of Purea Aqua Springs at your local mart today. 
And the last thing I want to ask you about, Ron, is where do you think, where do you personally think esports can go to? Do you, do you think it can get as big or will surpass the, the main sports that we have currently in the U.S.? And I'm talking, you know, hockey, baseball, basketball, football. I mean, lacrosse is getting pretty big and soccer is getting pretty big in the United States as well. But do you think esports can get to those measurements? I think they could surpass that in due time, just mainly to the fact that it's it's more open to everybody. Um, a lot of people could play League of Legends. Well, let's use League of Legends right now. A lot of people, millions of people could play League of Legends, maybe not necessarily play at the highest level, but, but will understand the game enough to watch it and root for teams where uh, that same amount of people maybe not might not play baseball or football. And so the fan, just your pool of, of fan base is going to be, or people that understand what you're doing is going to be a lot higher in esports. So I, I think that esports eventually could easily surpass uh, physical sports just because of the amount of people that could participate potentially in the lower levels of each e-game. And let's not forget when you talk about e-games too, and we talked a little bit about this in the past, Ron and I have, and that is mamas and papas, don't worry about your baby birds with playing the computer, that kind of stuff. Because e-gamers, if you want to be a real e-gamer, it's not just playing computer. you got to do other things too to keep your mind sharp and your body sharp. They have proofs and they have studies and they have all sorts of stuff already online about e-gamers regiments that you can go into, right? They want you to be in good physical condition. You're not talking about you're not going to be in basketball shape, but you're going to be in good physical condition. Look at all these e-game teams. You don't see a bunch of fat guys running around or that kind of jazz. These are skinnier. You see more muscular. You see more cats that are in shape every year that you look into these e-game things. So don't just think everyone's going to be sitting there with their <laughs> Captain Neckbeard action going on, you know what I'm saying, and their Doritos. No, no I mean, esports are going to – it's an endurance sport on, on every level. Um, these tournaments are usually really long. There's a lot of endurance with it. The better shape you are, it's just been proven that your concentration will be able to hold longer. Your fatigue will, will take longer to take effect. And you're going to start just seeing a lot of these guys that you're going to be seeing these esports – especially at the college level, they're not going to be any, they're not going to be big guys. Um, plus just the, the regime these guys go through. There's, I don't think you really have a lot of time to eat food because they are practicing 10 hours a day, eight, nine hours a day on top of, you know, going to school or having a job. So really I think what you're seeing is being an e-gamer. Well, uh, you might not have the cardiovascular health you need. You definitely won't have the obesity problem. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, we're running out of time, baby birds. So if Bron has any last things he wants to get off his chest to the baby bird nation, the words of wisdom featuring Bron the Ray King. What you got, brother? You got anything? Hey, everybody out here right now in America. It, we're in some. We're in what I call the trying times. I think every year it's always trying times. But let's just remember we're all Americans and we should all be in it for it together. And with that, baby birds, we will be back after this to close out the show. Baby birds, baby birds, baby birds, welcome back to the nest. We're going to send you out the same way we always do, with a little something to ponder as you flock away for the week. Don't forget to find us on YouTube at Team CND. Like and subscribe. Find us at Words from Wisdom in the Twitterverse. That's at Words from Wisdom. And Words of Wisdom at TeamCND.com. That's Words of Wisdom at TeamCND.com. Baby birds, I will leave you with this to ponder. When you are lonely, I wish you love. When you are down, I wish you joy. When you are troubled, I wish you peace. When things are complicated, I wish you simple beauty. When things look empty, I wish you hope. And with that, we are done. Baby birds, until you flock back to the nest, we are out of here.